So a big hand for Preston activist Tony Bamber. Thanks very much. Well, uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for inviting me back. Nationalists and nationalism is often considered uh, a one-trick pony. People say, all oh, those nationalists, they're all right. They're very good at standing up for their own people. They're very good at protecting their own people. But there's more to politics than just protecting people standing up. And I think people do nationalism a, a grave disservice when they think that nationalism is just about standing up for our own people. Certainly, standing up for our own people plays an important part in what we do. And it's hardly surprising, given the present circumstances that we're all in, that we tend to focus on protecting and defending our people. But nationalism is about much, much more. And so tonight, I thought I'd talk about and explore one of the main reasons why our ancestors were nationalists, why they believed in nationalism. And it's worth remembering that for thousands of years, the vast majority of our people and the vast majority of our leaders were nationalists. They believed in nationalism. And one of the main reasons they believed in nationalism, if not the major reason, was the belief that nationalism was the road to a healthy society. And so I'm going to talk about why our ancestors believed that nationalism was the road to a healthy society. But before I begin, it'll be helpful if I just go over how they viewed the nation, what they thought the nation, that word meant. Today it's bandied about and the, the word I think means something very different than it did a few years ago. When our ancestors talked about the nation, they saw it almost as a, a living organism, a, a being with a life in itself, almost like some people see a football club like Manchester United. They don't just see Rooney and, and other players, they see Manchester United. Well, in the past, our ancestors saw the nation like that. And they saw the nation as being composed of many, many different people who were bound together by a common, a, a, a common history, a common religion, a common culture, and common blood. And they thought that the, this, these commonalities produced in people a sense that they belonged to the nation. The nation was their family. It produced in them a sense of ownership, a sense of identity, a sense of being part of a team. And that in turn produced in people a willing, uh, a sense of obligation towards this thing that was bigger than them, a sense of duty towards the nation. And obviously the, the biggest example of this was in wars where people would sacrifice their lives for the nation because they felt they had a duty to do so. So in short, and that is a very short version uh, of, of how our, our ancestors saw the nation. Now why did they think that nationalism promoted health, a healthy society. Well, one of the arguments, and there are a number of arguments that they, they brought forward, uh, reasons why they believed that nationalism promoted health, and one of them was drawn from a view of the natural world. And they would argue that uh, every creature that exists on the planet is preordained and predestined to live in a certain way. And they would say certain animals are predestined to live a solitary existence. And they would include in these animals moles, panthers, eagles. These, these animals lived most of their lives on their own. And they didn't do that because they sat down one day and think, how should I live my life? I wonder how I should do it. They, they, it was just in their nature to do so. It, they were programmed by their... It, programmed into their genetic makeup to live this sort of life. Other animals lived as a social life in little groups. And these would include wolves that lived in packs, dolphins that lived in pods, 
Bees lived in hives, and these animals lived together in specific little groups, and they did so again. Not because they made a choice to live that way, or they thought, well, how should I live? It was in their genetic makeup. It was their nature to live that way. And our ancestors thought, to, thought, if you try and make an animal live contrary to its nature, you'll end up giving it problems. Uh, and to give you an example, I have a little dog, and my dog thinks that we are a pack. Me and the dog, I'm, in, in, in its mind, I'm part of the pack, and we get on well. If I made my dog live outside in the yard 24-7, I'd give it mental problems very shortly to wonder what was going on. It wouldn't like it. It'd get all upset. They say there's nothing meaner than a junkyard dog. Because it's made to live a solitary existence, when it's really just a domesticated wolf, it's meant to live a social existence. It's meant to live with others. And if it's forced to live contrary to its nature, you'll end up giving it psychological problems. Another example would be chickens in a chicken farm. I don't know if any of you have ever been to a chicken farm, but I have. It's almost a vision from hell. They keep these, the chickens in these enormous great sheds where there's artificial lighting and feeding troughs, and the sheds are just stuffed with thousands of chickens. When I went in, many of them, if not most of them, are missing most of the feathers. I said to the fellow, why, why is that? He said, oh, they pluck them out. Well, clearly there's something wrong with these chickens. There's something wrong with a bird that pulls out its own feathers. Other chickens were flat, trying to jump up at the walls. Some were going around pecking each other. They were giving themselves terrible wounds. Some were just scraping at the floor. I know chickens do that outside, but uh, the way they were doing it was obviously there's something crazy about them. And because they were being forced to live in a manner contrary to their nature, they were having psychological problems. The same could be said about trout kept in these fish farms. Uh, they keep these trout in enormous great ponds and apparently they're very prone to diseases. You've got to keep putting chemicals in the water to stop them getting diseased. Uh, many of them become impotent. The, the, the muscles become slack and loose, which is why fish farm trout don't taste as good as natural trout because they haven't developed their muscles. And some of them just go to the bottom and just give up the ghost and die. And they obviously, these behavioural traits are produced because they're forced to live in a way contrary to their own nature, against their instincts. And it sends them a bit crackers. And our ancestors would apply the same arguments to human beings. They say if you've, human beings are mostly animals, they have instincts and and predestined to live in a certain way, and they are social animals and predestined to live in specific groups. And the proof of this is you only have to look through history and since the beginning, since the beginning of time, human beings have lived in small groups. You can call them tribes, you can call them city-states, you could call them gangs, call them nations, doesn't matter what name you give them. The truth is they live in little groups. That is the way their nature propels them to live. That's their instinct to live that way. And it's in every corner of the globe from Antarctica to uh, the, the Amazon uh, forest. People live in groups. So our, our, our ancestors said this is the natural way for human beings to exist. And if you try and make human beings live uh, in, in contravention of their own nature, you will cause them problems. And this is true. You put a prisoner in solitary confinement or maroon him on an island, very soon he'll start going stir crazy. He'll start having mental problems. He'll go crazy. Another example would be children who are brought up in orphanages rather than in the family. The natural way to bring up children is in the family. Children, it's a well-known fact that children brought up in orphanages, which is really just a farm for young people uh, run by the council, are much more likely to develop mental health problems, uh, have, have all sorts of uh, social issues, etc., etc. And this is because they've been brought up in a manner contrary to their nature. 
Now, our ancestors concluded from this that in order for, to, to make a healthy people, they have to live in harmony with their nature. And living in harmony with their nature would mean living in a nation, being brought up in a nation, having a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, ownership, part of a team, and this would produce good health. Now, if our ancestors came to us today and they looked at our society, uh, they would say that we, the reason we have many social problems is because we are forced to live in an unnatural social construction. Our leaders, since the end of the last world war, have gone about deconstructing the nation. They have created one big amorphous group of people, a great crowd, where we're all different people, different cultures, different religions. We don't have any real sense of belonging to a group. We don't have any real sense of identity. We don't have a, a sense of being part of a team, we're just part of this great big crowd. We're rather like the chickens in the chicken factory or the fish in the fish farm. We don't really belong to anything, or at least the, the feeling of belonging is much weaker than it was when I was brought up. And this is because we live in this social and political construct called Europe, a multicultural world, which is not really a nation at all. The, the idea of, when I started this talk, I talked about what a nation was, it bears no resemblance to what we live in today. And we do have an awful lot of social problems. Do you know that 20% of the adults in this country are on antidepressants like Prozac? We, our doctors are prescribing our kids with drugs like Ritalin to control them. And those are prescribed drugs. Lots of people are self-prescribing themselves. Uh, I'm not just talking about having the odd drink, but there's an awful lot of problem with alcoholism. There's an awful lot of problem with people taking heroin. We have between 300 and 400,000 of our people on heroin. We have 200,000 of our women kill their own ch children, uh, abort their own children, um, just because they're inconvenient. How much crazier could you get than that? We have loads of antisocial behaviour. Most marriages, I think we'll get into most marriages, certainly very near to 50% of marriages, break down. We have problems like obesity, we have problems like uh, age, sexually transmitted diseases. There are many, many social problems in our society. It's an unhealthy society. And people could say, oh, well, it, there's always been problems. It's always... If our modern-day society is compared with the society of the 50s, they had problems in the 50s, but nothing like to the extent that we have them today. There is no comparison when you measure the incidence. The social problems are vastly greater today. In America, there's kids going into schools and blowing the mates away just for fun. How much more crazy could you get than that? So we've clearly got these problems. And our ancestors would say that one of the reasons, if not the major reason, that we've got these problems is that we are forced to live contrary to our nature. We're forced to live in an unnatural way, in this great, big, multicultural herd that is not a nation, it's just a big crowd of people that live on a, on a, in, on a certain part of the earth. It is not a nation. And consequently, people don't have a sense of identity. They feel lost and they turn into all sorts of, of uh, ways of existing, which are obviously strange. One, of, one telling point, which should be mentioned, is when you ask people, why do they drink so much? Why do they take drugs? They say, I want to get out of it. You'll probably have heard people say that. I want to get out of it. Well, I think that's a real insight into a person's psychology, that they want to get out of the world. Obviously, they're not very happy with the world if you want to get out of it. 
So nationalism, to return to my theme, is not just about defending our people from foreign invaders, it's about a healthy way of living. <coughs> nationalism has the answer to these social problems. It is our salvation. We need to return to living in nations, in groups, in tribes, call them what you like, but ident um, clearly identifiable groups of people. And in that way, we will solve many of our social problems. They won't completely go away, obviously, but they will be far fewer in number and far less in intensity if we start living in harmony with our own natures, which means living in a nation. Now, I'd like to finish with a few words, uh, a sentence drawn from a speech our chairman made last week, which I think uh, nicely sums up what I've been saying. He said, we do not live in a remotely normal or healthy society, but in a dysfunctional and diseased totalitarianism that it is our duty to oppose, expose and replace. I don't think I need to say any more. Thank you for listening. <laughs>